course and then a uh, career seminar class. And I also work for a digital installation artist here in town where I actually do a lot of photo and video editing. So that's actually where I make a lot of my, my bread and butter. So my name is Eric Dickens. I am from Toledo, Ohio. I currently live in Grand Rapids, Ohio. I'm going to just very briefly talk to you why I got into painting. So when I was a digital art student at PG, you know, I wanted to be an animator. Got into animation. Didn't really care for it as much. But one thing led to another, and then I got into pre-production artwork. So it's really into like illustration and like beat paints. Beat paints are what is done typically for an animated film to kind of design the lighting before it's set down the pipeline to other artists at Pixar. DreamWorks, Blue Sky, any of those studios. And so when I started looking at these artists that do these heat paintings, this is Dice Tatsumi. He was uh, an art director at Pixar for a number of years, probably best known for being art director for Toy Story 3. This is not what he envisioned on doing for his life. He wanted to just be a landscape and cityscape painter. That's what he went to college or kind of, and oil paintings, at least I'm a bit afraid. And all of those artists that work for those companies, those digital, like, whether it's for video games, whether it's for animation, a lot of them are trained traditional artists. The medium doesn't really matter. It's about <coughs> what they know, their understanding. And so he was able to create these little paintings that kind of describe the light of Toy Story 3 or a number of other films because he had this essentially visual memory bank from doing hundreds if not thousands of planar paintings over the years. And he was able to draw from that information and then just translate it on the computer. And he would stress, most of the artists would stress, you need to learn how to draw the game in life. Without a doubt, you have to do that because it's going to inform you know, whatever you do. And so you know, with this in mind, I was like, well, I need to learn how to do this. So Mila mentioned I went to grad school for uh, painting. She did it shortly after I did my undergrad here. And so I got into planar painting while I was in grad school. So I'm going to just give you a little bit of background on the historical aspects of planar painting. So we're going to start with John Constable. Anyone familiar with John Constable? Sweet. So he was one of the first artists to really, really actively pursue plain air painting. Partly because it was limited. At that point in time, two oil paints had not really been invented. And so an artist would have to ground up all the pigments, put it in linseed oil or whatever, walnut oil, and then they would have to transport that out into the field. That's really cumbersome, so it prevented a lot of artists from doing that. I'm not saying that he's the first artist to do plain air painting, but it's one of the first, and I think he made a, a fairly dramatic impact. Now, these are some of his plain air sketches. They're beautiful. They're simple, and you know, he doesn't probably have a whole lot of pigments that he's using, but it is his way of taking notes. That's why artists would do this at that point in time. They would go out into the field and take notes, and then they would bring that information back into the studio and make the finished work. So those planar paintings, those studies that Constable did, they usually didn't see the light of day. Those were just for him. And this was like the early part of the 1800s. So this was also before really the invention of photography. So this is the way that he collected that information. And he predated the Impressionists. Everyone's familiar with Impressionists. I think they get a lot of credit. Um, one reason that a lot of those Impressionists painted out of the field was the invention of two oil paints. So they had that accessibility. They were able to transport their materials out into the field fairly easily. I just think this is an absolutely beautiful painting in terms of capturing the light by on the Sometimes 
this was the finished work. It was completed completely in the field. And they didn't take back that, those notes and work on it in the studio. You know, the impressionist is a very strange term for a group of artists, because not all of them felt like they were impressionists. And so they all had different methodologies or principles that they adhered to. So some of them would complete the work completely in the field while others did not. So we're just going to move on. John Singer Sargent, anyone heard of John Singer Sargent? I'm sure many you have. I'm sure Brandon has brought him up a few times. So I like this example partly because we have the study on the left, and then we have the finished work on the right. And we see the essence of the study in the final painting, but it changes, it gets altered. You know, there's more things that have been added to it. So this is really why plein air painting kind of existed, was once again to just take notes, to bring back that information and revise it. Now sometimes I tend to enjoy the studies even more than the finished paintings. There's a vulnerability to them. There's, uh, I think, a spontaneity and an energy that doesn't always get translated into the finished work. But that's not to say that you know this isn't a beautiful painting by any means. It just serves a different purpose. You know, kind of at the same time as both impressionists and Sargent. I love the Russian realist, Isaac Levitin. Um, I think one of the most beautiful landscape painters. I love his work. This is actually a pastel. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily a finished work. I think it's more or less just a sketch. But you know, he was into creating mood landscape paintings. Uh, definitely recommend checking it out, his work. And this is one of his more finished paintings that you probably do both out in the field and then into the studio. Um, and unfortunately, there's so many artists that make beautiful work and just don't really know about it. Go on to Ivan Shishkin, another Russian realist. This is a study. I think this is ridiculous. There's a lot of information. Once again, this is done. You know, I approach drawing and painting in you know, the landscape in more broad terms. I'm not going into detail. You could go to this extent, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I'm just showing you kind of a different approach that uh, you could use. And then he would do finished landscape paintings in the studio. Uh, this is maybe one of his more famous works, and they're just fully developed, fully realized. Going to briefly move into <coughs> some of the American Southwestern painters. This gentleman, Edgar Payne, he wrote a wonderful book on landscape composition. I don't have that with me today, but I have a bunch of other books. I would recommend getting this book. It's wonderful. The one thing that I do like about his work, kind of in contrast to Shishkin, Look how broad these strokes are. You know, there's not a whole lot of detail, but we essentially, he's given the viewer the opportunity to fill in the gaps. He encourages us to use our imagination and to kind of imagine. As opposed to painting every single detail, he more or less suggests things. And I kind of take that sort of philosophy when I'm out into the landscape, leaving it broad, leaving it kind of loose allowing the viewer to use their imagination to fill in the gaps. And in one way, it's in the contrast to my studio work, which is giving all the information. This is just another little landscape painting by Edgar Payne. You know, I think you can see this is just a blotch of color here. Same with here. So it's not really that well articulated. But it's just about the color. It's about the atmosphere. It's about the light. And that's how I approach landscape painting. So we're going to talk about some contemporary painters um, that are doing landscape painting. Jeremy Lipton. Anyone heard of Jeremy Lipton? 
in some regards, it kind of, he's considered maybe the modern day sergeant. He just makes exquisite works in the studio. I like his studio works, but actually I prefer his landscape sketches um, because they're simple and they're efficient. There's not a whole lot of information here, but once again, they're broad. And these are fairly small. When I go out in the studio or out in the landscape, I usually need maybe anywhere from four by four inches, maybe up to six by eight inches. I don't usually go that much larger than that. You know, these are just me collecting information and taking it back inside. And one thing that I should mention, although this is fairly broadly stated in terms of the mark making, there's not a whole lot of information. It's super deceptive. This is easier said than done. You know, when I saw this work, I'm like, yeah, no, we do that. No, not at all. You know, it takes a long time. You will see in the other room, I brought in all the little plain air paintings that it did throughout the summer. I think there's like almost 100, maybe not quite, maybe a little less than that. There's a lot of terrible paintings that I produced. You have to make a lot, you know, to sort through that amount of information that's out there. When you're in the studio and you're working, everything's completely controlled. Out in the environment, that goes all out the window. You know, the light can change super quickly. Um, you might be painting something that you enjoy, let's say a car, and then boom. You know, that happened, this happened to me several times. One other thing that I would recommend, or if you can find, is paintings that don't go so well you know, for artists. I love this painting by Jeremy Lipkin because he didn't complete it. These are, this is gold to me because you can see the process and how they build up. <coughs> uh, I think he stopped painting this because I think it started paling and the mosquitoes were absolutely terrible in the Sierras. That's going to happen. You're going to have environmental factors that kind of impede on your progress. But, you know, that's part of going out to the field and actually experiencing it. Instead of just looking off a computer screen or a printout, you actually see all these colors and you actually witness things. Uh, Mark D'Alessio, uh, he's kind of in the same camp. I just like this painting because of, once again, how he built it up. Now, although I haven't seen any of his work in person, you know, we can get a sense of maybe how he started applying the paint. We can see areas that are pretty thinly applied in terms of you know, the paint has either been turfed out or it's been kind of dry brushed, and then to areas that have more opaque paint. And so we can kind of see how he approached the paint. And so, look at that. If you're ever on Instagram or you're looking at some of these painters online, try to dissect how they would have approached it. Glending. In some ways, this seems overly simplistic. You know, some of the work tends to be fairly simplified, but there's something about it. You know, there's a physicality to the paint that's really uh, quite satisfying in this paintings. Eric Merrill is another South, uh, or lives in Southern California. He's kind of well known for going out into the desert at night and doing nocturnal paintings. And there's a beautiful, probably like a half hour documentary on his website that kind of goes into detail on him doing that. And it's kind of terrifying going out into the middle of the desert by yourself in the night and trying to do a painting. You know, you can probably run into some stuff. But the one thing that I really like about this, and it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to. Uh, communicate maybe on a projector is we're not getting all the colors here. You're not going to see these sorts of colors in a photograph. You have to witness it in life in order to capture it. And I can, the reason I like this painting is there's this warmth on the underside of these clouds. It's not really translating that well in the projector. And I get giddy about that because I know exactly what you've seen. And you can only see that if you see, if you go out into the field. 
Mary Cornell Johnson, um, once again, just really broadly stated work. You know, there's a lot of color going on in that painting that you just wouldn't start from the photograph. So sometimes I have gone out to the field and I've tried to take uh, have essentially the same camera that Neela has, trying to take some reference images, and it just doesn't compare. So you kind of need both. Maybe a quick sketch with oils, and then maybe some photographic reference to go back into the studio and really kind of compile that information together. So I'm going to show you a little bit of my work um, so you can have a bit of an understanding of where I'm coming from. So these are some plein air field studies that I did over the summer, most of which are actually in the other room that you can see, where I'm just kind of playing around, you know, broadly stated, and just applying paint, playing around, seeing how I can build up, you know, the surface, and just playing with it. And these are a few other ones that I actually did just a are five by five inches. So talk a little bit about process. Drawing. This can be kind of a pain, but you know, since I'm keeping it fairly loose, and a lot of these planner painters are keeping it fairly loose, say drawing is still fairly critical. It all depends on what you're after. When I'm out in the field, I'm after color, I'm after depth, I'm not necessarily an accurate drawing. So, you know, I can kind of let that be a little lax. Usually when I start off a plein air painting, you know, I either use this, just my hands, to determine my composition in relation to my panel size, or I actually have a viewfinder. You know, one or the other. And what I usually do is I divide it either into you know, quadrants or into thirds. And I will put like little like nicks on my panel. That way I can get just the general relationships, the very large shapes onto the surface quick. And I don't do a whole lot of information with the drawing. You'll probably see that in a little bit. And I leave it at that. You know, this gives me just a quick way of getting the large shapes down onto the surface. Once again, I will use some very basic things for drawing to compare things. Got fun line and just comparing how one thing will relate to another either vertically or horizontally on the picture plane. And if I really need to be analytical about you know an angle, I always usually think about it in terms of you know how it will relate on the face of a clock. And these are just ways for me to break things down if I really need to get something correct. Um, and I usually geometricize everything so that it's hard lines, hard angles, and then I develop it a little bit further. I'm going to just talk a little bit about color. Um, I mainly use a warm and cool primary set you know, to get a full range of colors when I'm out in the field. Simplicity is key. Actually, I'm going to do one thing real quick. So this painting right here, I had a lot of fun doing this one. Seems like there's a lot of colors. There's only three pigments plus one to do that. You don't need a whole lot of color. Granted, we have a lot of browns. We have you know some high key areas, but it's not a whole lot. I would always recommend simplifying your palette down to just the bare essentials, at least early on. You know, this is my personal philosophy. Probably may contradict what, you know, your faculty members would say here. That's their usual. So I don't want to go contradictory to what Brandon says and Neela says or what Dennis would say. So this is my palette. And there is the pigments. These are kind of the exceptions um, to the warm and cool primary set. Cobalt teal and yellow ochre. I usually like to do 
just an initial wash to get a mid tone on my panel with a yellow ochre mixture. Don't know why, it's a little arbitrary, but I just enjoy it. Um, the titanium white, air white yellow, sometimes I will switch out with a different cab red or a cab yellow. Apologies. And quinacridone red. One thing that I should mention is just about all of these pigments, there's a few exceptions, they're heavy metals. So there's uh, an opacity to them. When you're out in the field, you need to have opaque paint. Because you're reacting very quickly, you need that paint to stick on that surface. Now, if you use something that is traditionally used for glazing, where it's really transparent, it's not going to really work that well. I did a painting of last spring that I think I was using, I don't remember what sort of green it was. And it was really transparent. And I just could not get the paint to stick to the surface. Yeah, I think it was sap green. Um, love the color. I absolutely love the color. But it just doesn't really work. I should also mention, I have almost exclusively just single pigment paints. Has Brandon talked to you guys about single pigments? Or Mila? About single pigment paints? A little, bit, a little bit? So, one thing about single pigment is essentially this is a thing we use list. You want something with just a single pigment. You know, <coughs> if you get, say, flesh tint is probably the worst example, because um, it's also the best example. Because it's a bunch of different pigments, single pigments that have been pre mixed for you in the tube. Why not just buy the pure pigments that are unmixed and mix it yourself? And so I always start with a pure ingredients list and go from there. Um, you know, and sometimes I swap some things out. Um, I should mention that the ultramarine blue, the quinacridone red, and the aerolite yellow, those ones are not like heavy metals based, so there is a little bit more of a translucency to them. But I usually always combine it with another opaque paint. So that kind of mitigates that issue. Uh, I mentioned that I use a warm and cool primary set. So cad red, super warm, super lush, whereas my quinacridone red has this cool undertone. By having a warm and cool primary set, I can essentially obtain just about every color, you know, in the visual spectrum. Within reason, you know, obviously there's some limitations. Now I'm going to show you just a few of my other paintings. So this is a little studio painting. I do a lot of paintings based on toys. However, I'm starting it off just like how I would a landscape painting. It's really loose. It's really broad. This drawing kind of sucks, you know? But it's giving me like the basic shapes for just about everything else. Then I just put down paint kind of fairly thinly where it's turfed out. And so I slowly but surely over time refine the drawing so that it gets progressively tighter. That's how I work. Uh, this is a painting that I'm currently working on. It's about the 95% incomplete. Uh, most of it's just blocked in. But you know, it's the same sort of principles. You know, would just essentially keep things fairly loose and slowly but surely refine things. You know, but doing everything from life. The landscape paintings that I do out in the field informs exactly what I do in the studio. Slightly different in terms of the amount of resolve that I put into it, but how I approach building up the surface is exactly the same. I want to be honest, I do use photographs from time to time, so I'm just showing you one last example of me using a photograph to complete a painting. So sometimes I use multiple lights with different uh, colors, and you know sometimes painting from life for that is it's just a little bit more difficult. So I will photograph it, use the photographic source, and I will do usually a quick color sketch just to have like an initial impression and just to play around with different color combinations, different pigment combinations to get the desired effect. 
uh, this over here has been gridded out and then I start to flock it in on the surface. Once again, this is completely, it's full color, but everything's really turfed out, so it's very lean. There's hardly any fat in it, so I can start adding opaque paint on top of it without any issue of it cracking. I'm sure that my paintings will crack at some point. I'm not saying that. I completely avoided that, but we'll see. Um, and then this is the finished painting. So, and I'll show, I just have like two more slides. And this was like uh, my main painting for my thesis exhibition, which was in 2015 at Edinburgh, University of Pennsylvania. And this is 24 by 70 inches, and I started the painting exactly in the same process as everything else that I've shown. I'll just talk about a few wonderful resources. So, these are some great books I highly recommend. I have a number of them in the other room. This book pretty much got me started in painting, giving me some basic concepts, some principles under my belt. And he's a wonderful animator. And say, don't be deceived by maybe the cheesiness of this cover. There's a lot of great information in it. And he uses his understanding of painting in the field to write children's books, where he does full paintings, you know, to create these imagined or imagined environments. Richard Schmidt, this is a great book. He's an excellent teacher. I would say a lot of like the contemporary realist movement kind of stems from this gentleman's um, teachings and highly recommend picking that up. And I've read some of the Edgar Payne book. I think it's it's great. And then also How to See Color is also wonderful. We live in a wonderful world in some regard. Uh, we have access to a lot of information at all times. So I am on Instagram quite a bit, partly because you can follow artists posting in progress work all the time. Paint Guide is one of those resources. It's, I think, the it's the name of the group. And I would say just follow it. You know, because you can not only see contemporary artists, you can see those artists and their influences, and just about on a daily basis, they talk about paint. I mean, this is what excites me. And so if you have more information at your fingertips, take advantage of it. So that's pretty much it for the PowerPoint presentation. I didn't want to bore you guys too much. Uh, we will go outside in a few moments and do a landscape painting. I do have some of those resources in the other room along with a lot of my landscape paintings if you want to take a look at that before we go outside. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. What was um, the writer of Color and Light? Color and Light? His name is James Vernon. <laughs> any other questions? I have a question. Uh, so it seems like you're pretty invested in, in terms of your interests in at least what you've shown us. Uh, people on, on the, the western half of the country. Yeah. Um, is there also interest, uh, I'm going a little further back in history uh, in terms of American painting, uh, but uh, people like Fairfield Porter, Jane Freelicker, uh, Neil Welber, uh, it's like the East. Yeah, East I, I love Porter, and we talk about Porter, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking about the movie here, but I wanted to make this a little bit more succinct. Uh, yeah, I don't know why. Uh, I tend to gravitate towards the West Coast, maybe because it's so open, and so I'm really engaged with space and depth. And so, because they're dealing with an environment that lends itself to that, maybe I'm just actually picking up on it. Because one of the things that I, I do find to be personally frustrating painting in this region is, oh, it's so it's not as dynamic, you know, in terms of topography as maybe the West Coast. And so also during like the, the spring, everything's green. And so it's really hard to create a sense of depth when everything is like
was, was Edinburgh in the hills? It wasn't in the hills. Yeah. And so that was fairly nice to actually have some undulation yeah. and some different vantage points. So, and that's one reason why I've been painting the river a lot. I live in Grand Rapids, Ohio, and so my backyard is literally the Mommy River, and it's more interesting fishing. So that has been kind of wide and picking that a lot. So, I, mean, I enjoyed this uh, Sonoma in the early spring, so I need to figure out how I can get my out there. So, uh, family vacation is probably going to get turned into me. <laughs> I have a comment, or I'm sorry, did you have a question? always spent towards either reading or making work. Um, during the semester, though, it's uh, admittedly a little bit harder to uh, find time to make paintings. And, you know, my studio paintings are on the complete opposite end of the spectrum in terms of the amount of time that they take for me to resolve. Uh, I showed one painting that was like the main work in my thesis exhibition. This might not seem like that important, but it was about 500 hours 
for me to really bring it to fruition. These are like three hours at max. And so, you know, it's a lot harder for me to set up time to make a fully realized studio painting, whereas this is like just quick. Um, there's a lot of failed paintings in here um, that I'm not super happy, but I figured it's good for you to see both maybe some of the successes and some of the less than desirable work. I don't paint buildings that often. Um, that's actually Adrian College, the campus there. It's like the last day of spring semester. I was like, we're going to go on something. We're going to do something. It's not going to be. <laughs> um, they're all on Masonite. I prefer Masonite. I don't really paint on canvas a whole lot just don't care for the texture as much. Um, and sometimes I don't like painting on canvas, but it's just sturdy. You know, these are already pre-gessoed and they're just kind of nice. So I like to save myself time. And I know I'm painting a little bit up front, you know, to get these already pre-gessoed instead of gessoing them. But I live in an apartment. Gessoing with carpet is not good. Uh, I did spill the whole thing of gesso <laughs> uh, on the carpet. That was kind of fun. And Bianca helped me clean it up. Uh, so. <laughs> Do you use any kind of clear coats after you finish? Oh, it? great question. Uh, yeah, most of these paintings have been, uh, once they're finished, once they're dry, I do put a little varnish on them because the varnish kind of helps retain the vibrancy of the colors. Because a lot of times after you put down the paint, it deadens a little bit. Uh, I love color. I want it to be truthful to what I saw. So, and I mean, I'm still experimenting with materials. I'm not sure if the varnish that I'm using is completely ideal. Um, what do you get these I usually just order them on Pink Flick, uh, which is a wonderful website for art supplies. Okay. They usually have pretty good deals. I mean, Jerry's Artorama is similar. So I think, uh, you know, like Hobby Lobby, I think does have some, not that many. Uh, and I know that the Art Supply Depot also has something that's equivalent. So I like this brand, um, but, you know, I'm sure you can find a comparable brand that doesn't really that's just as good. Uh, these are some of the books that I mentioned. Uh, this is a wonderful resource. Uh, this is the Richard Schmidt book. As you can see, I've used it. I spilled a bunch of linseed oil all on it shortly after I got the book. Um, just shows that it's been used a little bit. Uh, this is the paint guide that's on Instagram. They produced a book. These are a lot of contemporary painters. Uh, this is a wonderful resource. Uh, to maybe take a look at and see what's going on in Pinky currently. Um, and obviously, I have one of my like studio paintings with toys to kind of show the difference. That was me just kind of experimenting, and it kind of turned into like, a finished painting. Uh, and that was done all from observations for life. So, um, this informs that. No. I did block that one in a little bit differently. Um, I actually did more of just a, a wash, I think with like a Venetian red, and kind of did a wipe away technique a little bit. So. What do you mean by wipe away technique? Uh, where I'm allowing, like let's say I do like a mid-tone value that's just like been really turfed out, and while it's still kind of, while well, it's still wet, it's not dry, mm -hmm. you can take a dry brush and essentially wipe away and create the value structure that. Oh, okay. um, so more like a traditional like monochromatic under painting slash drawing for the work. I usually don't work like in that method. I did a lot in undergrad, but most of the time I do a full color underpainting that's just loose and turfed out. Um, turfed out. Yeah. Uh, this is also 
I haven't really done this as of late, but this is just color swatches. It's a whole plug of different pigments that this is, I think, a great resource if you're in this school. Ask maybe one of your friends if they have a pigment that you're like, that's freaking awesome. Ask them to get a, just a little bit of it. Make a color swatch. See how it looks. Either, here, let me find a good example. Um, what it looks like in the mass tone. So this is a great example. A mass tone, uh, essentially a tint of it, and then what it would be once it's mixed with white. So that you can see all the color properties and actually play around with it. And so you create like a, uh, a whole data bank of different pigments from different brands because every brand is going to be different slightly. Um, I, for the most part, use Windsor Newton almost exclusively. I mean, I do use Williamsburg. I also use Michael Harding. Um, and they're all fairly comparable. The one thing about you'll just find like some pigments that you like from one brand versus other brands. Windsor Newton, their yellow ochre, I hate it. It's so gritty. It's like painting with sandpaper. And that's why I almost exclusively use Williamsburg's yellow ochre. And you just find what works best for you. Um, that's hilarious. I love the gritty concreteness of oh. the yellow ochre. <laughs> I hate it. Um, you know, I guess because most of the other pigments are so buttery, I would like to maintain that sort of consistency um, when I'm doing my work. So, I am a bit of a paint snob. So, you know, like, Winton is a complete no-no for me. I mean, you can make it work. There's a lot of artists that, it doesn't matter the materials. It's about your understanding. You know, applying those principles to make them work that you see fit. The reason that I kind of want to have the nicest and purest pigments is when I'm in the studio doing my toy paintings, those are really exotic colors because I'm dealing with plastic objects that are like almost neon in nature. And so I need something that's really potent, really vibrant. And if I go with Winton that has like these proprietary mixtures, I just don't think it's gonna retain that color and it might not have that sort of longevity over time. I don't know exactly what they mix things down with, but it might, the color might just fade, you know. There might be more fugitive pigments that they're using, you know, and I just don't want to have to deal with that being a possibility in the future. So, any questions? Um, I like to do one. Like, are you used to like it being hard and bumpy, or do you just like not I would prefer it not being like this. Here, let me grab my, my new box. Um, this is my new one that I got uh, over the summer. Um, this is all I use outside. This is nice and clean um, because I learned what I should have done with that. In addition, I also made this insert so that I'm actually not using the real. Um, wood that came with it, so I'm not ruining it. Because that sucks. You know, it ended up making that kind of unusable after a certain point in time. Because things just get caked up. Um, and I also made another one just so once this one is no longer usable, I can toss this one away and start fresh. So, you know, things you learn by just doing it. And is that like a plastic one or something? Or just like a plastic one? What? This? Yeah. No, this is, uh, this is I think, just balsa wood. Then I put a bunch of linseed oil on and kind of sand it, you know, over time. And it, it gets a nice patina um, after you use it for some time that, you know, it works for me. So... You usually go about cleaning your brushes while you're in the field. Um, so yeah, that takes a while. I'm bad with that. So I, don't, <laughs> I usually just, I leave them. Uh, kind of wet, and then it's when I get back home, then I'll clean it with just mineral spirits and spit. <laughs> spit is actually supposed to help. Um, I don't know, I'm just starting to do this, but you know, the, the natural oils that are in your saliva actually protects 
the bristles, the hair. I mean, it kind of makes sense in a, to a certain extent. Um, so that it doesn't damage the brush. Uh, I don't have like a shop sink, so I'm not putting mineral spirits down the drain. I kind of want to avoid that, so I'm not really washing it with soap. Um, I used to do that, but I also use a solvent that is eco-friendly. You know, try to do that as much as possible. Granted, sometimes I do use lead white. It's not healthy. Some of these pigments aren't good for you, so um, I guess I try to offset it. Uh, cleaning on brushes in a safe manner. Um, and then one of the nice things about this little contraption is, you know, I have my panels just right in the back of this. Um, this doesn't hold my turp, uh, my turpentine, so I always carry around this, this bag that's probably drenched with linseed oil and it's probably a, a fire hazard. But, <laughs> Hopefully nothing nothing has happened as of yet. Um, and you know, this is really all you need when you go out into the field. You have to have a hat. There's no way around it. You need to look goofy for the sake of looking goofy. Uh, it's actually so that you know when you're out in the field, you're not being blinded by the sun. You know, you're kind of narrowing your your focus. Uh, in terms of the amount of light that's hitting your retina, and you can see everything. You know, if I'm out in the bright sunlight, you know, it's bleaching things out. You, know, you need a hat. You usually should paint in the shade. It's one of the difficult things about landscape painting, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do it effectively. Is painting outside looks really nice, but you're kind of more or less in the sun. You get inside, and the painting looks terrible because essentially the light you know, from the sun is affecting what you're seeing. And so you tend to make it too dark. Once you take it inside, it's like, oh, that doesn't feel luminous because you have so much light on that surface. So I do have uh, an umbrella that I do use from time to time. I just got this. It's not the greatest with wind, so we're not going to use it today because uh, Fuji is not forgiving when it comes to that. Um, so you try to set up maybe in the shade of some sort, you know, whether it's in the shade of a building or under a tree. The problem about being under a tree is you're going to get dappled lighting. If you have inconsistent lighting between what's on your painting versus your palette, and you have maybe a hot spot here and there, that's just not good. So there's all these other factors that you have to think about when you're doing plein air painting, and it's just like. It's so much, there's so much to think about that I think it's until you just start that you slowly realize, oh, I don't do this, or do that, don't do that, do this, you know. It, um, and I'm still trying to figure out what works best because every scenario is different. Absolutely every scenario. Any other questions? When you are cutting your brushes, like, I mean, I run out of the top all the time. <laughs> I want to paint as much as I want, you know, but I'm limited to where I can clean the brushes at. Mm -hmm. I do not want to paint because I either have to come over here and I'm painting for hours on end and I have to, sometimes at night, I don't want to come over here at night because it's kind of sleepy. Mm -hmm. I have to go downstairs into like the base of the building to clean my brushes. How do you manage that in your own home? Um, well, since I, I essentially I just use just this, my little container for my turf and I just use a rag and this to kind of wash them and I don't need a sink necessarily. I don't think that's maybe the best advice for longevity of the brushes. You know, I'm not the best at maintaining these things. You know, I spend a decent amount of money on getting nice brushes. I should probably take better care of that. So. I think you can get away with just using this until you can get to a wash sink that you can use. It's not going to be that detrimental to the brush. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, because first thing I'm using my Turbo Nash before a brush, I'm like, oh, what about an alternative like using Dawn dish soap to clean it down a sink? Um, I, I mean, I, I've used Dawn before in the past, and it's, it's fine. Um, I usually, I'd be happy to give you, like, a 
quick like brush cleaning thing for everybody. Murphy's oil soap is actually really good. Just sit it overnight in a, I don't know, jelly jar or something like, and, but I, yeah. yeah. I'm happy to, t Murphy's oil soap that you clean floors with, and it's, it's very <clears throat> environmentally friendly, and it gets all the gook out. I think ivory soap, soap is also pretty good, too. That's what wash I it, but... So you yeah. just like dump it on the like Well, I can talk with you. I was just thinking maybe afterwards. I was going to say if we could hold off on that, <clears throat> if you don't mind. Pardon me, just because um, it was so exciting that Aaron was going to paint outside today, and I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, We've got 50 minutes of my class left. I don't know if Brandon has talked with you <clears throat> about time or anything, but Aaron, how are you feeling about time limits? I mean, I'm, I probably are like you to really start fast. <laughs> yeah, I can work decently fast. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna get a finished painting. There's just no way. So uh, yeah. we can just talk about the process. Make yourself comfortable. Mixing things. What, what's to be more haphazard? Um, I can assure you that it's not as haphazard. Uh, I also have all of my pigments um, in these little drawers, which makes it fairly convenient. I really like this setup. Um, if anyone's interested in a planner kit like this, I can write it down for you. The one thing about it is it is handmade, so I ordered it and it probably took maybe almost four months for me to finally get it after I paid for it, so it takes time. But I think it was definitely worth the investment instead of getting essentially the same one that I had gotten um, before that you saw up there. I have one for sale too if anybody is interested, a French easel. I was trying to sell it. you to isolate your view so that you have uh, your composition to keep it in mind. But I just usually square it up with my ratio and just kind of design something that you find that's interesting. And then Lee already came out here earlier to try to figure out what sort of drawing <laughs> that I wanted. So, um, just go that. so the first thing that I usually do is I mentioned that's going to happen. And sometimes I only use maybe one or two brushes. Um, just get a lot of turf on the surface. I do like to use um, my yellow ochre. I just initially I'll do a little more red than I want. And that kind of makes like a muddy brown with maybe some more of a, like a golden undertone. I'll admit, it's really difficult to talk and paint at the same time. I'm sure Mila can attest to that because, you know, drawing and painting is on the opposite hemisphere of our brain. And so, or on the opposite hemisphere from verbal communication. And so you have to shift back and forth. So if I stumble and sound kind of like, I don't know what I'm talking about, I apologize. And I like this to be really pretty, pretty long. And this allows the painting to have a fairly unified tone from the beginning. You know, I know it'll peek through in certain areas. And I'll just have a common thread, a common color, and tie it all together. No, I don't actually. Uh, 
Sometimes if I'm in the studio, I will use linseed oil. But not for this. Not for this. Because this is completely direct. Um, and I'm just using the pigment and whatever linseed oil or walnut oil has been already mixed with it. So I think that's a decent tone, at least for the moment. Um, but I don't leave it just like that because it's really soupy mm -hmm. on the surface. And so I will actually use a rag um, after maybe it's set up for just like a few moments to kind of absorb into the porous surface and into the gesso and then wipe it off. Um, so that way when I put down pigment, it sticks and it doesn't, you know, like want to just move around because there's so much dirt. You know, some of this is kind of arbitrary, honestly. Um, you have to figure out what you like, what works best for you. Some days, I might want more of like a gray background. You know, something that's a little bit more neutral. And other days, more red. Other days, more yellow. I don't know why. That's fine. You can't have an answer for absolutely everything you do. It has to be something that thing I usually do is I do establish the drawing. I like to use CAD red. I, I don't know. Um, I think because it's pretty vibrant and allows for me to really see my large shapes on the surface. And usually I paint uh, one edge to another edge. Whatever seems to work best for you. I mean, you could use green, you could use anything else. I kind of square up and see what my composition is once again. And I like to make this kind of easy for myself. Um, to find me some large shapes that would make the tree line that I'm seeing in the background is going to be right at the halfway point. Oh yeah, I draw with the brush. Um, I guess maybe they didn't specify that, but I would encourage you to learn how to draw with the brush. It's really awkward, kind of strange at first, but I think it's a really good skill set to have. So, tree line back there halfway point. Go back to angling and measuring. Wow, that does not seem like that's the right way. Know that this is slanting down, and you know, I wanted to just check that measurement. And I, if I pulled out like a straight edge, I'm just comparing it. And it's one of those things where our mind plays tricks on us, and it doesn't. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. But it's reading as an angle that's going up. Think about that. That's like really messing with my head.
like I said, I don't usually paint buildings a whole lot, but it's kind of what we have. You know, I'm not keep, you know, just trying to keep your loose. I really like about this little area is we got a nice patch of red, we got a nice patch of green, we got this band of yellow, and then we got some kind of brown in the background. So we have a lot of colors to play with, even though it's still kind of muted down. You know, we're playing with the primary colors. Again, we don't have much time to be outside to do this, so um, I know that that shape for that tree is a lot more complicated. Well, I can make that, I think, or like that shape when I put down the paint, the actual paint, and create that shape through that way. So I'm not going to spend time worrying about getting that contour. I like to start usually with that back tree, almost always. Back tree line, then I work my way to the sky and get those large relationships established early on. Um, not saying that this is formulaic or there's, I have Now that I'm gonna start painting, I'm gonna to have to use a lot more is it also just has an isolated like pinhole so that way you can hold it up and you can look at a color and just isolate and so you know although there's a lot of information back there you know it's essentially kind of you know and one of the strange things maybe strange is not the best way to put it is like you know, you just kind of develop over time, you, you become so familiar with your pigments that you will see, you know, a particular problem, color problem. And you'll know, well, this has a little bit of a violet undertone, so I'm going to use quinacridone red, since that is a cooler red, as opposed to cat red. So you start to develop just start to just memorize what works best for a given situation. So at the moment I'm using quinacridone red, cad yellow, and ultramarine blue. I almost always find like a particular area, like you say this back tree line, and then I'll just use those three pigments for that whole um, color problem. That way I can just kind of keep it simple. I'm not introducing the fourth pigment because there's no need for me to introduce the fourth pigment. Um, you know, giving yourself limitations is a good thing because you learn how to work with those limitations um, as opposed to just this infinite variety of colors. You know, if I was trying to just grab this color, that color, that color, it's too much for me to keep track of in my mind. But 
am noticing one thing that I kind of didn't foresee. Um, there's a, like a really yellow tree in the background. And, you know, the color combination that I have isn't quite the best for it. Um, I would say using the Aerolite yellow would have been better. But, you know, I can always go back in and kind of accent that in later. I'm just going to add a few more little accents here for now. And then I'll go on to the sky. As I mentioned, I love cobalt teal. It's like my one of my favorite colors. Partly because for the sky, almost exclusively. As you know, bugs are. It's one thing you'll have to deal with. Have to deal. As the sky you know gets closer to the horizon, it usually becomes warmer. It usually becomes a little bit more yellow. And sometimes, I'm not saying in this instance, but that might be the perfect solution for the color of the sky towards the horizon. Obviously, I would have to add stuff to it, but it's going to get me closer than like a cerulean or even a cobalt blue. Um, let's see if it works. Just using one brush, keep it simple. So I'm probably going to use that. Uh, cobalt teal, a little bit of cad red, or not cad red, but cad yellow, and a little bit of the I think that's going to get me the blue that I want. I think it needs a little bit more warmth. That's what we do. I don't I know. I did, I did, I I'm, tr it. I'm trying to not talk because of the video, and I didn't want to wreck it, like your presentation. But um, I would point things out. I know maybe it'll make it a little easier for him if I talk. But there are such great points that have been brought up today about the consistency of the paint. I know Grumbacher was my drug of choice when I did plein air because it was dry, very dry, very tight. Um, the Williamsburg, I use it for some things, but it's extremely creamy. I like that. And see, we're, but that's where I was just like, I didn't want to interrupt your flow, right? But there are such great points that Aaron is bringing up yeah, that have to do with painters, right? If you have any questions, just ask me now. That's right. That's right. <laughs> this way I don't have to complete a whole painting in front of you. Oh, <laughs> come on. You know, if it is like left unfinished, then you're like, but, oh, on its way. Uh, but also the way he's talking about the cool and the warm. Yeah. You know, it, it, I think it helps every time we hear it. And yes, you know it. But having a person like Aaron come and say, yeah, but I do it too. Maybe in my naive mind, it kind of verifies it a little bit. Because like teachers, okay, you got us. Like we're here all the time. Yeah, whatever. They said this and that, right? But there is something, I think, to be said for like somebody closer to your own age from you know, to see, hey, wait a minute, they're doing this. And they're saying the same things. You know, I think it maybe helps. And it doesn't matter that you've learned it before. You can hear it again and again and again. a lifetime to really fully comprehend them and implement them you know so you're going to do the same projects over and over again but look at like, a lot of the great painters you know they're doing the same work but they're repeating it over and over again because there's still something for them to explore and so to learn
still new. Um, so yeah, I mean, same concepts that everyone's already mentioned in your classes, but you know, I don't feel like it wasn't until I got to grad school where maybe one of my other teachers mentioned something. I'm like, yeah, that's what Dennis, that's what Brandon yeah. was talking yeah. about. You know, yeah. the idea of single pigment paints. I thought it was just the name that was on the tube. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other world of understanding your materials that, yeah. you know, just even though it was mentioned to me, I thought I kind of knew it, I didn't know it. So. And it's one thing, um, we had a guest here recently that um, Lyle Salmi was here from Millican University, and he has a, you know, very different take on landscape and his talk and stuff. Um, similar though I think to what you're saying he was pointing out to students that it's one thing especially with the internet and having the accessibility that we have to all these things ideas paintings everything at our fingertips but it's one thing to kind of know about it and like look at it and it was but he, he said it's something else to be able to like own it and to really um, you know maybe physically feel it in your own work or your own mind. And I thought that was a good point um, because we, it's just so easy to think, oh, we already know that. Well, maybe you, we do. I know certainly I know things. I think, oh, yeah, you know, I don't need to do that. But then I get reminded in my studio, I do need to revisit that. And I know I can spend the rest of my life doing those same things over and over again. That's what we do. We just kind of make small, people call, call it, what is it, Pilgrim's Progress or something? You know, like really slow increments towards our goal. And if anything, you know, many of you talk about how fast everything goes these days in the world. You know, a painting is a way to slow down. That's so nice. You know? Kind of go outside You know, if it's a beautiful day and you don't want to be inside, but you want to be productive, what a better way than going outside and doing some playing or painting. Um, now, I'm not like so concerned about getting every little part covered always. Um, so I, I allow some of that underpainting to kind of show through some of that time. This building and the sky uh, at the tip up here, and it's it's really kind of blue violet, and so I need to kind of add more paint to kind of push down that color. I don't want to do it too much where it seems kind of artificial, but. Yeah. 
washed out because it's, it's in the sun. Sometimes, you know, it's not until I actually 